comrades, Europe is once more on the brink of revolution. A data revolution is sweeping through capital cities across the continent and making more and more information available and at a faster rate than at any point in human history. Quite frankly, it's baffling. And happening so quickly that not many of us have been able to get our head around what policy and what policies are actually going to come out at the other side, or indeed whether they can be delivered more efficiently. So, welcome to Measuring and Evaluating Determinants of Public Administration Productivity, a keynote lecture from a selection of the world's leading researchers. We'll be looking at how you can help design better policies, but also how to improve productivity. And who doesn't like getting better results for less money? First, we'll be looking at who is using big data really well at the moment. Spoiler alert, the tech giants may feature in this section. But then, we'll be drilling down into what makes the public sector different, with an assessment of government data, why there's so much of it, and how it can be used better. Crucially, we'll be looking at ways to boost civil service productivity and performance. Then, finally, advice on implementation and how all this can be made a reality. So, to kick us off, who is actually using all this stuff well? To answer that, here's Gemma Tetlow, Chief Economist at the Institute for Government. The public sector doesn't seem to view data as an asset in the way that many private sector companies do. I mean, there are big private sector companies like the social media giants who make all their money off the data that they hold and how they can exploit that. Public sector, on the other hand, doesn't view data in the same way. The public sector tends to use data in the way that's needed to get through the day-to-day -day operations. Thanks, Gemma. Now here's Sir Tim Besley from the London School of Economics. There are risks around, will the public sector be able to have that degree of innovativeness and entrepreneurial spirit? Where the private sector certainly has an advantage, it's smaller scale, it can, it can experiment. You know, if a firm goes bankrupt in the private sector, that's too bad, but you can't run large deficits in the public sector without people getting very upset about it. Next, here's Mina Shoilakova, project manager at the Structural Reform Support Service at the European Commission. In the private sector, you would say that if uh, yeah, there are lots of sales, if there is a lot of working hours, that probably means that work uh, has been done and the, the, the company is growing. But in the public sector, the logic is inverse, that if public administration is working well, then you would have less of certain types of services. You will have less people in hospitals, probably, because they will be treated well in advance. So, what can civil servants do to use data well? We have an enormous amount of information about citizens coming from various sources we never used to have. And one of the key capacities of the state is to use that data for the public good. So the availability of more data to both monitor what citizens are doing, how they interact with the state, uh, uh, allows the state both to plan better, um, how to um, allocate future resources to different activities. So there are going to be some areas where, in fact, already I think we're seeing technology playing a very central role in um, processing a service and delivering it. So you know, now being given a driver's license or something like that can be almost fully automated. There's some background checks and some other stuff you have to do, which may involve some direct human interaction. But actually searching databases, matching photographs and anything else can be done more or less automated. To expand on that, here's Imran Rasul, Professor of Economics at University College London. It's not so much in terms of always putting in place ways to collect new data, it's as much harnessing the existing data that exists, standardising it, finding ways to collect it more systematically in a harmonious way across different bureaucracies, bringing that together, making that available for researchers, potentially linking that across different types of data set that government departments hold, and then really using that to the best purposes to both evaluate policies that have been implemented and then to use that knowledge to feed back into optimally trying to design policies in the first place. And as part of that, does big data need to storm the barricades that separate different government agencies from each other? There's been one very nice example in recent years led by the Department for Education where they have managed to link up information on people's educational attainment and which university they went to with their subsequent earnings data through the tax records. And that's been really powerful in understanding what do people get out of taking different types of university degrees. 
And you can look at that controlling not only for what university degree you did, but the attainment that you had going into that. So you can understand essentially the value added of your university education on top of the skills that you already had before that and what financial return you got in terms of your earnings from going to university and studying that particular degree course. There are understandable concerns around using the data that government has in new and different ways and particularly to sharing government data across departments uh, or to using people's data in, perhaps in a way that they didn't intend it to be used when they originally gave it to the government. On the other hand, there are costs to not using government data more effectively. In a world where government resources are increasingly stretched, actually understanding more about the population that the government is serving and how they interact with different services and how all the range of government policies affect their well-being could be enormously valuable in helping to target government resources more effectively to achieve more with less. So, data can help a lot with policy design, but it can also be revolutionary when it comes to making policy, any policy, become a reality. So this, I think, is the key sort of uh, next generation of studies, and it goes back to something that a friend told me uh, 20 years ago. We studied together on the, on the undergraduate economics program at LSE, and he went off and, and worked in development in the real world and is really at the, at the coalface in uh, providing policies. And I remember having a conversation with him uh, maybe about a decade ago um, about some of the programs we were evaluating, and I was asking him, well, should we design this program this way or that way? And his reply was, it doesn't really make a difference. That's really second order to him. He said, you give him any program, and the key thing that's going to make that a program a success or not are the people who are in charge of implementing that program. And what he was saying was that program implementation, the details of that, understanding what are the incentives of bureaucrats to implement programs to get them rolled out, are far more important than exactly how we might design a program. And here to tell you how big data can do exactly that, is Professor Jan meyer zaling a political scientist from the University of Nottingham. For a long time there was the assumption that if you adopt a new law, then automatically you will have implementation. Um, but what we could see in many countries in post-communist Europe, but also we see it in, in developing countries uh, around the world, um, is that um, in fact, there is no, you know, often laws are adopted, but then subsequently they are actually ignored um, or the implementation doesn't really work as it was intended. Uh, we are not just using it in the best possible way. We are not really embracing all the opportunities and we're having a lot of gaps. And in my view, the, the reason for that is indeed that we are very much focusing, focused on, on trying to, 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 to justify what we are doing, rather to learn from what we are doing. In the public administration, we are very often thinking about data as a tool uh, that we need in order to ensure accountability, to say what we have uh, been doing, how we have been doing it, uh, what costs we have been, uh, uh, what we have made in order to, to uh, deliver. But at the same time, we are losing this perspective of how we can use data to improve internally our organization. So that requires a bit of a different mindset, how to use data for organizational uh, needs. You would look at the whole processes, you would uh, use much more systems thinking. Here is Christian Schuster, Associate Professor at the School of Public Policy at University College London. Imagine you're a manager in a public sector organization, really in any public sector organization. Your ambition will be to deliver results for citizens. And one of the core challenges you have when you, when you want to do that is the people that work for you. You need to make sure that they are motivated to work hard, they are qualified to do their jobs, they are committed to public service and to staying in your organization, and they need to work with integrity and not divert funds, for instance, on their job. So one of your core tasks as a manager is to manage people in a way that maximizes work motivation, that maximizes commitment, that maximizes integrity, uh, and that as a result of that helps you deliver results for citizens. Now, if you're managing in a small unit, you may have good tacit knowledge about that. But imagine you're managing an organization with many employees, with many units. One key source for that are surveys of public servants combined with administrative data and combined with field experiments with public servants. In order to run a survey, um, the approach that we usually try to take 
is to really survey all categories of staff. To start with a top civil servant and to go all the way down to those who are in secretarial posts, clerical posts. You might not survey the drivers, but the wider the scope, the better, because these are the people who work in government and they are the ones uh, whose opinions we actually want to have. You find in surveys or in, in, in research that there's a focus on the very top, on the, on the higher civil service, the senior civil service, but that is often quite a different reality from what you see in the middle ranks or in the lower ranks, but they make up much, much larger numbers. Um, so in other words, by actually widening the scope and surveying all employees of the administration, going outside the ministries into agencies, subordinated organizations, um, you of course get a much, much more comprehensive picture. Uh, it helps any minister, any head of an institution, because that person can now, that, that authority can now compare him or herself to other organizations in government. For instance, what are strengths and weaknesses of my organization? How am I doing in recruitment relative to other organizations? How am I doing in performance evaluation relative to other organizations? How am I doing in work motivation of my staff? What we found when we conducted these surveys is that many times tacit knowledge might not be as good as you think it is, particularly once you go from sort of small units to the level of an organization or to the level of the country as a whole. One of the things that we're often looking at in our surveys is what explains why some public servants behave more ethically on the job than others. So for instance, you can give public servants ethics scenarios, conflict of interest scenarios, and you ask them, how, how should we resolve this conflict of interest scenario? And you want to make sure that if there's a conflict of interest, public servants are able to detect that and are able to act in the right way. So in Chile, for instance, we found that the key management practice that government had to improve integrity in government, which is ethics trainings, didn't actually change these ethical behaviors and ethical attitudes at all. So whether or not a public servant had ethics training made no difference for their ability to resolve ethical dilemmas, for their knowledge of ethics codes, and for their ethical behavioral intent more, more generally. This, for instance, was really useful for the Chilean government, and it led a series of institutions to revise their approach to ethics training to make sure, uh, or to, to, to enhance the likelihood that these types of trainings could actually uh, instill what, what, what they're supposed to instill, and that is, that is the right values, but also the right ability to, to resolve conflicts of interest, to detect and resolve conflicts of interest. It can move you beyond the subjective, anecdotal policy making in civil service service management to an evidence-based policy making that takes account of the realities across government, across institutions and across units. So I, I've been engaged in a, in a long-term project with my co-authors Martin Williams and Dan Rogger uh, with the Central Civil Service in Ghana and how the way in which bureaucrats are managed affects um, the productivity or the production of government services. We codified outputs of government departments in the Central Civil Service in Ghana, recording what were government bureaucrats actually responsible for and to what extent were they meeting those targets. This, for the first time, really gave us a grand span view of what government bureaucrats in Ghana's uh, Central Civil Service were doing. It's often been the case that economists have tended to focus in on those aspects of, of, of uh, bureaucrats' work which are somewhat easy to measure, say related to infrastructure projects or uh, procurement type uh, contracts. But two thirds of what they're doing are project types which are typically much harder to measure. Designing particular policies, engaging with stakeholders, and a core part of that project was to try to collect holistically a broad uh, collection of different measures of all of these types of both physical infrastructure and non-physical infrastructure types of activities that bureaucrats were doing. Subsequent to that, we were able to link that whole variety of different types of uh, bureaucratic activity to the management practices that bureaucrats were being subject to. We found that in the context of Ghana, giving bureaucrats more autonomy increased their production of their, their, the, the, these projects uh, and giving them uh, greater monitoring or trying to incentivize them in, in some way actually led to slightly worse performance. Well, that all sounds pretty great. So here are some tips on how to do it cheaply and easily. The monetary costs of such a project are often not particularly high um, because using digital technology allows you to scale up very, very easily. In, uh, in Estonia, um, we could just send out an invitation to participate in the survey um, to, I think, 14,500 uh, civil servants, um, and it was just... Uh, uh, one, uh, one click of a button. 
at the same time, you get a lot of new evidence and you get very detailed evidence. Um, you can compare across institutions. You can compare different groups of civil servants, senior civil servants, higher, middle, lower ranking civil servants, old civil servants, young civil servants, civil servants who work in this department versus another kind of department. So it gives you a kind of evidence base that probably people 20 or 30 years ago were not even dreaming of. And evidence, of course, allows you to tailor your reform efforts. Now you can go to the Ministry of Education and say, I guess you have a leadership problem there because this is what the data says. Um, so why not investing in leadership training there? Um, because there are considerable, um, there's a considerable potential um, for you know, your institution. If you improve leadership, you will have better outcomes subsequently because our data can actually show that. But that's the thing probably that we've been trying so much to prove that um, we are um, being managed well, that we are efficient, effective, that we are performing well. But we, have been, we haven't been focusing so much on uh, developing ourselves as learning organizations. And when you start thinking about the learning organization, you start to see what data gaps you have. From my experience, I think the, best, the, the, the most important thing to, to put an emphasis on is to uh, develop the skills. And that, uh, of course, requires different kind of uh, skills, uh, different kind of professionalists that are able to, to, to think through uh, the, the, the opportunities that uh, data and, and digital is providing. It's essentially to help build that data capacity within uh, bureaucracies to begin with, so they're not reliant on researchers in the future. That's the, that's the um, best effective way for data to actually be collected, not just for any given project, but just as a change, sea change in culture of why we need data, how we best use data um, to answer all of these questions because ultimately we can get things right or we can get things tremendously wrong and the only way we're going to work out whether we're doing things that have benefit or not is by having some sound analysis of data that's being collected in a harmonious way. Different cities can say well we tried this and this worked or we tried that and this worked um, so that best practice can be disseminated because that's very, very important. In the market, there are natural ways in which best practice disseminates because you know, the most successful firm will take your market if you don't do what they're doing or at least try and respond to it. The public sector has a less automatic mechanism for emulation of best practice. So we really need to build in um, both experimentation and learning um, in order to promote these ideas in the public sector. So there you have it. There's a data revolution on the streets and on your phone and laptop and tablet. And it's here, whether you like it or not. That data revolution that's taking place, the data that's being generated, will only be of value to society to the extent that that data is actually harnessed and used for good purposes. Bureaucrats of the world unite. The data revolution will welcome you with open arms. <laughs>